Okay, good morning. Good morning. Those of you who may not know me, my name is Tim Kensler. And Michael has to travel today for a business meeting. He asked me to uh, teach the class today, which is on applications. This is the last class in the series. So the first half will be on the topic, and then the second half, uh, Matt is going to do some Q&A. That's code for test. <laughs> so that, that's uh, kind of the plan. So let's pray and get started. Father, we thank you for your word that we desire to uh, read and to understand and to use in our lives. We pray Holy Spirit would guide us in our lesson today that we might accomplish those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 12 in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12. And by the way, my contact information is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, my email address and my phone number. Uh, like the other classes are being recorded, so I'm going to a couple of times refer to those that aren't here, such as now. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, instead of being in class, my email address is tim, T-I-M, dot hensler at gmail.com. And I offer that in case after class sometime later today, next week, or whenever you have questions, you can go ahead and get, you can give me a call or text or uh, email address. Also in the lower left-hand corner is a website. I have a little website that I'm using for instructional purposes. And the material I'm presenting today uh, is on that website. And that website is uh, bit.ly forward slash r3respond, R-E-S-P-O-N-D, all lowercase, all one word. So uh, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash R3, R-E-S-P-O-N-D. So I don't have handouts. I do have paper here. If you do want to take notes to write down something or doodle during class, I prefer the former, but it's up to you. And uh, paper is there for that purpose. But uh, everything that I'm uh, going to present to you, it's not a lot, is, uh, going to, is on that website. As well, the website has a lot of additional information. If you just scroll down a little bit, uh, there's a few other things that I'll describe here in a moment that, that can be helpful in our endeavor. So, so um, we're going to uh, look at really two items as it relates to what's commonly called application. Uh, personally, I like and use the term uh, participation. God invites us to participate with him and uh, really instructs us to in many cases. And uh, to me, application is what grandma puts on the grandson's knee, you know, or it's something you do for somebody else, uh, or it's an app or something. Uh, to me, participation doesn't leave any wiggle room. You're gonna participate with God. So that's more my favorite term. So you'll hear me use that several times. And what we're going to do is learn these two aspects of participating with God. And then we're going to use uh, Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 as uh, our test case that we'll do and walk through together today. So you get a feel for uh, participating with God through a particular passage. In Matthew 25, 21, Jesus did not say, well learned, good and faithful student. So that might sound a little familiar. So what did Jesus say in Matthew 25, 21? Okay, the word servant is in there. Well done. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Those are action words, you know. You've got to participate to uh, fulfill that. And uh, that's, that's the way Jesus worked. He spent three years uh, teaching and training his disciples. And at the end of that time, he did not give them a test to find out what they, what he, what they learned. Instead, he expected them to do what he taught. And the same is true for us today. He expects us to do the things that he taught us. And uh, if our memory is a little fuzzy, then we might be relying on what we remember or learned 
And if you find a gap there, you need to go back and find out what it was he was teaching. So very important that we understand that God's word includes not only his message, but his methods, how he wants things done, as well as what he wants us to do. Um, a Bible student and a, a homicide detective have a few things in common. Not a connection you usually make, but it's there, okay? Uh, both need to find out who, what, when, and where. They also need to figure out why and how. Now, if the Bible student or the homicide detective figures those things out and go all done, is their job done? Maybe. Maybe? <laughs> I think it's a trick question. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a trick answer. No is the answer. No, their job's not done. The homicide defect, detect, detective, oh boy, a detective uh, needs to take action. He needs to respond to everything that he's found out. And that usually means he goes and arrests the perpetrator or he turns it over to the DA and, and they get arrest warrant out or whatever. What about us? If we find out who, what, when, where, and we also figure out why and how, what are we supposed to do? Take action. Take action, yeah, back to Matthew 25, 21. Yeah, we need to respond. We need to respond and participate with God according to his word. Respond to the word, participate with God. Special, important formula. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. Um, by the way, that uh, statement on, in 25:21, we remember that God's word is uh, written a long time ago to other people. But it is written for us. Paul made that a big point to the Corinthians twice. And so, uh, for instance, in Romans 15, 4 also, it says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that we pass the test? No. So that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's, you could debate whether that's a thought thing or an action thing, but uh, it's interesting, um, thinking of a particular passage we'll point to in a little bit, uh, that uh, hope and faith has a relationship together that really means action. So... Uh, we're really implicated in those passages that point out that the Bible is written for us and we need to uh, respond accordingly. So the first question, and there's two key questions in terms of responding or um, uh, participating with God or applying. And the first one is, so what? Finish reading and studying, uh, so what? This will involve questions and statements of implication. Things are implied in God's word. Sometimes it's very direct, and God tells us, do this, don't do that. But uh, overall, there's an implication that we're involved with this, uh, uh, the word of God. And so we need to be aware of that and refer to it. And so there's a couple examples here. What we're going to do is go through these examples, and then we're going to talk about how we can participate with Hebrews uh, 12, 1 and 2. First, let's look at some of these uh, ideas here. So, so what? One question you could ask in pursuit of that is, what is so important about this passage? So you're reading a passage, or maybe you're actually studying the passage. You need to think, so what? Too often, people read the Bible like a newspaper, and they're just gathering information in their head, and some of it sticks, and uh, unfortunately, too many believers are satisfied with that, because sometimes in a discussion, something will come up, and then they'll know about it. Uh, it's not a newspaper. This is something that we really need to pay attention to. So we really need to find out what's so important about this passage when you're reading it or have, have come up uh, with it. Now, this is important because this points back to what Michael taught us about the timeless principle. A timeless principle is a principle that is not tied to any particular time, which means that this principle works and is important to the people back then as well as to us today. So you can exercise these principles now and then, not occasionally as you think about it, now like then, okay? So, 
to pursue, really to understand so what's so important about it is, is to look for what is so important about it. Uh, another one is, okay, my finger's getting carried away. What did God want people to think or do back then? When you're reading the passage, you need to kind of pay attention to that. God does not just write his word for whatever, bored one day or whatever. Right? So there's a purpose there, and we need to understand that. So one of the things that can help us to participate with him is find out, well, what did he want people to think or do back then? And that gives us a hint. That answer to that question is usually in the text or uh, the context, the part above or before or after uh, the study text that you're reading or studying. So you want to be able to find out what it was that he wanted uh, them to do or say, or not do or say back then. The third one gets a little personal. What does this passage say about me? When you're studying the Bible, you need to wrestle with yourself. In my, my Bible study process, I call it interrogate. You know, that, that the homicide detective hits a scene and he, he inventories all the, the evidence on the crime scene and the people, makes lists and so forth. And then he interviews people about it. And then later he focuses that attention and he interrogates. Well, you need to interrogate yourself with regard to this passage. What's the passage saying to me? What is God laying on my heart to know and to understand so that I can respond to the word and participate with God? Sometimes it means an adjustment in my life. Sometimes it's an opportunity for me to serve somebody else. And a number of other things can happen there. So what does this passage say about me? And a uh, fourth example of answering the question, so what, is what does God want me to think or do here and now? So he already in the second question found out what it was God wanted the people back then to think or do. And then you wrestle yourself over that, and that's going to give you some hints. Well, now, you ever hear the term, the rubber meets the road? You know, that's where your tires are. That's where the traction is for stopping and going. And that's what this question is doing. Now it's time to think about knowing what they did, how you're affected by the passage. What are you going to do about it? What does he want you to think or do? Yes, sir. Tim, it's amazing how simple this is, but I can't tell you how many times I'll be studying for a sermon even, and I've got all the data, but then I'll have to just stop and ask, Lord, why did you put this paragraph here? Yeah. Like, why is this here for us? Because I'm struggling to get the timeless truth or the big idea, and that question gets me in the right frame of mind. You put it there yeah. for a reason. Yeah, and that's hard a lot of times, and, and unfortunately among uh, teachers and preachers, there's a lot of work done to their credit to really find out what does it say. But too many, and, and this is, doesn't, well, I know you wrestle with it, <laughs> but you overcome it. And I, that's one of the things I appreciate your preaching, is you know, why is it here and what does it have for us? And uh, I've heard a lot of teachers and preachers where they get stuck and they kind of read the newspaper for you. They'll, they gather all these facts and got them in and out they come to you and, and there you go. You know, do thou go and do thou likewise kind of thing. But you, you need to really wrestle with it. You need to find out, not only what, what did God want them to do or say or not do or think, you need to deal with it yourself. And of course, it's not just respond to the passage, but as I keep saying, you need to participate with God. Participate with him in adjusting your life. Don't so much participate with him to adjust somebody else's life, and that unless that's truly your role in their life, like your children, maybe as a mentor or a disciple maker, uh, you might have a responsibility to do that uh, with somebody else. <coughs> maybe you're a supervisor to somebody, and each of those cases needs to be handled uh, differently in a godly manner, in a helpful, uh, loving manner. But um, God wants to work in our lives, and he wants to use us to work in other lives, all for his glory and pleasure. So those four things there. When we finish a, a passage then, uh, there are some suggestions how we can ask so what. So would somebody read nice and loud and clear Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Who would like to read Hebrews 12 1 and 2? Come in. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight 
and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Very good. Okay, so uh, look at yeah, stop there. Look at those questions there. How would you respond to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Well, let me back up. What is something you learned about Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, either this past week or, or sometime in the past? What are some things you learned about Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Or that you see in front of you right now? Yes? It says that then fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him and the cross. Okay, so what do you learn from that? Well, we're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus. Okay. Um, fix your eyes on Jesus. That's kind of like um, he's the author and perfecter of our faith. Yeah, and that's the reason why we want to do that. He's the author, the instigator, the leader, the um, explorer, whatever. He went on ahead and uh, created and pro provided uh, our faith and uh, the path we're to follow. And not only uh, did he um, found it, but he perfected it. He made it complete. There's nothing beyond the faith that he offers that we would ever need. It's a complete faith. Anything else? Yes? Um, the word run. I don't know. I can't remember what the Greek word is, but uh -huh. I remember learning that it to be so back in the time of like with agony and suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, running a race with endurance is it's going to be difficult. And then to, to this point earlier, um, what you're looking to at the end of that race and uh -huh. that race is Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Paul loves sports analogies. I'm sure I could guess where he would be today on Sunday afternoons. I could take it from there. But uh, yeah, he he's uses this word run. I don't think this is the one you would think of an, uh, the, the word that we get agony from. But uh, it does mean to there we go. Yeah, to, uh, to develop in a positive way, spiritually or in discipleship, conceived as running. So that's the idea that he has is that we're running a race. So, looking at these questions now and Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, what can you see? How can you answer some of these questions out of, or how would you respond to uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Either the question, why is this important? Or what did God want the people to think or do back then? Well, I, and I'm not, the Hebrews back then were the Jewish Christians, uh -huh. right? And so they were probably uh, facing a lot of persecution and choosing that path at the time. Okay. So um, I'm sure this, yeah, spoke to them pretty clearly. Whereas to us today, we also face persecution, but probably not as bad as they did. In some cases. Yeah. But more than 50% of Christians around the world here. are persecuted. Yeah. They're facing as much or more as these guys. So to them, it would yeah. be different. We're, we got it too easy. You're right, though. And uh, the, the letter was obviously written to Jewish believers because of the amount of Old Testament in it. But there's a few hints of Gentiles, too. So I personally believe this was written to a church. It wasn't just an open letter, but probably open in that it went from church to church. And they had trouble. Another thing about it is the word therefore. Remember what you're supposed to do with that word? What's it there for? What's it there for? Well, it's always there for whatever before it. Chapter 11. What is Hebrews chapter 11 known for? Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith. And one of the frustrating things I have about that is all too often it's used like a concordance. If you want to know something about Abraham, you don't know where to look him. Oh, he was one of those faithful guys. So you go to 
to Hebrews 11 and it works like a concordance because your Bible probably has a footnote that sends you back to a couple places in the book of Genesis and you learn about it. That's not what Hebrews 11 is for. If you look at that, every one of those people says, by faith, and then describes what they did. By faith, what they did. By faith, you get the idea that it's by faith, the intangible, they did something tangible. They responded to God's word, sometimes written, usually verbally uh, at that time, uh, uh, and then they participated with God. And so they are an illustration, a huge library of illustrations of how we are to participate with God, how we are to respond to God's word. So, so what? So you can use these again in the lower left corner is a website where all this information is. You can find it with a lot of extra I'll refer to in a moment. Uh, but uh, help you to participate with God. Respond to his word, participate with God. So uh, the second uh, term that we're going to deal with is, so what? Okay, so what? And the whole idea here is to find or come up with questions or statements of participation. Uh, here are a couple of examples. One is what can or should or must I do in light of and in response to this passage. And I give you those three options, not that you can pick one and disregard the others, but by what can I do? It means there's possibilities. You can study Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and maybe there's nothing in your life that particularly connects to this. Well, think about what are some possibilities. What are some options you have that might come up and you could practice this, you could respond to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and, and, uh, and be able to participate with God. Uh, what should I do? Well, this is a case where that opportunity has now come. So hopefully you've thought ahead, prayed ahead, prepared ahead, and now you know how to respond. So the opportunity has come. Somebody's in a situation, maybe you're in a situation, so now is your opportunity. You should do something at this time based on Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And then what must? What must I do? We have an obligation to respond to God's word and to uh, participate with God in our lives and through our lives. And so we really need to pay attention to every passage. And like Pastor Matt said, sometimes it's kind of hard. You've got to wrestle with why is it here? We know that it was written to people a long time ago, but at least three times I can remember Paul said that it was written for us, not for some exam but for us out of the head, heart, and hands, respond to it, do something, work with God on it. So what can, should, or must I do in light of and in response to this passage? Another example is how will I participate with God according to this passage? So in this one here, we really, uh, this is like I mentioned before, the rubber meets the road, the chips are down, um, it's time to face the music, what will I do? And again, if you prepare in your studies ahead of time, thinking through what we're talking about, you'll be ready. You'll have options. You know when you should respond. And you understand it's an obligation before God for you to un uh, respond to his word. Very important. You need to think, too, these opportunities are part of the race set before us, as it says in uh, verse 1, that things don't just happen. God is constantly work. For the last few months, for some reason, God has been testing me, teaching me, and retesting me on the matter of his sovereignty. He's sovereign. He's in control. He doesn't deal with or cause every little thing. He's not micromanaging you, but he's got these guardrails, and you can work within these parameters. But he keeps tapping on the shoulder. Are you sure you want to do that, Tim? Well, he's sovereign. He knows better. He knows what's over the next hill. And so his sovereignty is, is what God's dealing with with me right now. And so we need to anti uh, participate with God and be ready for those things that do come along so that we're ready to do them. And we understand not only can I, but I should, and it's an obligation to respond to this situation. Matter of fact, one of the Bible people, just an amazing man, uh, you might want to study the book of Ruth sometime. A man named Boaz in there, 
he's an excellent example of responding to God's word and to participating with God. And I say study God's word, there's no reference at all in there that he's got a copy of the Old Testament law from Moses, through Moses. Uh, but the way he acts, his values and priorities are right out of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. So he understood them and he responded accordingly. So he responded to God's word and he participates with God for the kingdom of God. <laughs> he probably had no idea how close he was to the kingdom of God. You'll get that in chapter four. Oh, that's right. We're going through this. <laughs> I had to set that in there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, some questions now. Um, first of all, what are the two key questions that we're supposed to ask ourselves after we've done the who, what, when, where, and we figured out why and how? We have two key questions. The first one is. So what? So what? And the second one is? Yeah, now, what? now what? Right, you got it, okay. So, um, what did you get out of what we just covered in lightning speed? <clears throat> what, what just kind of hit you between the eyes? When you said that we need to wrestle with it, I think I don't, when I read it, I'll kind of look at it from the surface, but I don't really sit there and wrestle with it all the time. Especially if it's something we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. We read a passage of scripture and we just keep reading. Mm -hmm. um, I work with uh, Wayne and Jaime every other Wednesday, and um, we're uh, looking at uh, John 3, 16 through 21. And of course, we probably most of us uh, can recite John 3, 16, but do you know what comes in 17? or 18, or 21. You know, that is a block of thought that's pretty much intact and stand on its own, although it's closely related to what's before and after and the overall context. But if you take a look at that, and you do, we read through it, oh, I've read this before, and so our eyes keep moving, our brain goes into neutral, and we're coasting along just happy as a clam. But if you pause and consider that, then uh, it's very impactful very impactful. So what do you think you need to plan or do as a result of this class? Read more Bible. <laughs> Read more Bible? More Bible. Okay, more Bible. Can't get enough of it. That's the way I was. As soon as I was saved, man, I couldn't get enough of it. I still can't. <laughs> it's an endless well. Yes. I think maybe not even just reading more text because it's kind of like you said, like I'll just read and my eyes will glaze over and I'll think about it a little. Yeah. Like, and analyze and say, oh, what did he mean for this? Or I'll jump right all the way to the end of What does that mean to me? Especially in Leviticus. Yeah. <laughs> especially, especially. You go and you start getting down in some weeds that you just don't like and we skip ahead. But yeah, we just keep going. Yeah, just and uh, keep it. reading and uh, it's familiar so we moving along, but you need to stop. Actually, Leviticus is a great book. I love it. I thought I threatened to teach it a few times, but nobody wanted it. <laughs> yeah, we need to be conscious of that and respond to the word and so forth. Uh, the uh, website there in the lower left corner, bit.ly forward slash r3 respond, all one word, all lowercase. Um, on there, this information I gave you, including all the questions and my commentary, are there to help you remind uh, yourself of it. And also at the bottom, there's uh, a few different things that uh, uh, can be helpful, sections that when you click, they open up. Uh, one of them is about eight spiritual disciplines that can help you apply. You know, you're wrestling with something, you're convicted by it, how, how do I deal with this? What do I, how do I respond? And so there's several things there. For example, then, um, Find a friend, a trusted friend that you can confide in, that you can ask them to hold you accountable, who can help you think through this, to help plan, how do I respond? Maybe you're, you got some sin bothering you, and uh, so this person can help you work your way through uh, getting out of that sin. Maybe it, it's a relational problem with somebody. Uh, you know, there's an endless number of situations, opportunities, where you can find um, 
help in the Bible. You just need to respond to it and, and participate with God. So and there's there's eight different ways to do it, and if you do them all, you shouldn't have any trouble. Another one, anybody here of um, smart um, what is it? smart goals? Smart goals. It's a business thing, but I've used it in ministry too, and it's a way to really focus on goals. You know, if you you want to stop eating chocolate donuts, okay? But it's hard. Believe me, that can be very hard. Uh, but uh, you, so you have a goal to stop it. Well, you need to do some things that, that uh, can help you set a reasonable, attainable goal and accomplish that. And so smart goals are in there. Anybody here a SWAT, and I don't mean special weapons and tactics team, or special weapons and tactics. I mean SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Another business thing, I've used it. I was teaching a year or so ago. Um, from the book of Revelation. We have the seven churches in chapters two and three. We actually use those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to evaluate those seven churches. You can do it to evaluate yourself. It's very handy if you're gonna make a decision, like, wow, should I take this job or should I volunteer for this ministry? Well, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What opportunities are there? And what are some threats that'll work against you in making that successful? So those kinds of helps are uh, on that website also. So uh, just offer it, and I hope that that kind of thing is helpful. Great. Anybody have any questions what we covered? It was kind of fast, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so at this point, it's your opportunity to ask questions. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Pastor Matt, and you can ask him questions. The scope of these questions can be... What's that? You can just hold on to the mic. Hold on to the yeah, mic. Yeah, I think you did a good job. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate him this morning. Thank you, Tim. Um, so what I thought we could do, and Tim, you can sit okay. if you want. Um, we'll just, uh, we can, as you think of questions, ask them. But what I thought we could do to end, it is 8.50. It's take 15, 20 minutes of just dealing with some hard passages together. And so we'll hop in, we'll look at the common misinterpretation, we'll use all that Michael and Tim have given us, and uh, quickly come out with maybe a better understanding. Sound good? Yeah. So if you got a question, interrupt me. This is informal, casual. Um, I do want to say this. When we moved here and started asking God to plant a church, we prayed for older, and I don't mean old, but older than me, men and women who loved the Lord and specifically who knew his word and loved his word, and I am so grateful for some of those with more gray hair than me who have been in the word a very long time, and if that's not already evident of both Michael and Tim and several others, then uh, I hope you get to know these men and their wives, because I'm so grateful. Tim, thank you for teaching, and more than teaching, just for loving the Lord and his word. I like to use the phrase, Tim's a Bible guy. Tim's a Bible guy, Michael's a Bible guy, and that's a good thing. If we're gonna err on one side or the other, uh, I'm very happy to err on that side of things. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right, so turn over to Matthew chapter 18. Again, if you've got a question, bring it to your mind. Ask it. We'll find a way to steer it back into what we're doing. But uh, Matthew 18, and again, we're looking at commonly misinterpreted passages. Uh, my pastor, Brian Hughes, taught a How to Study the Bible course at Montana Bible College. When I was first saved, I audited it. He did this exercise one class, and I just have never forgot it, and I've done it many times since. So, um, Matthew 18, Monty, if you're there, could you read, Monty Jr., um, <laughs> could you read verse 20? For where, there, for where there two or three are gathered in my name, there am I, am I among them. Okay. So, two or three gathered in my name, there I am among them. What do you suppose the common misinterpretation is of this verse? Yes. So if we had a dollar for every time someone claimed this verse for any prayer meeting, any gathering of Christians, uh, house churches, etc., we would all be very wealthy. This is super common to grab it and say, hey, where two or three are gathered, he is there in my name. What's the problem with that? Context. Okay, so context is a problem. We'll look at that. The other problem is the promise of the Holy Spirit. What do we get as Christians when we come to Christ? Yeah, we get salvation and Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says the Spirit what? Indwells. Permanently indwells. So the reality is I actually don't need two of you, and Jesus is already here with me. 
And if two of you are with me, it doesn't somehow add to the specialness of a prayer meeting or a worship gathering or a church in a living room. What this promise is, look at it. Paul, you want to take a shot at it? What do you think, because you know this passage, you and I have talked. What do you think in the context this promise of verse 20 is addressing? Sure. Well, at the time, uh, in uh, Jewish tradition, they required to have, I think it was a large group of 10 people together in order to pray. And what the lesson here is that, just like you said, you don't need to have <laughs> the statutory minimum number of people to be able to pray and petition and to be with the Lord. Good. So then, in addition to that, look at verse 15. What's verse 15 about? If a brother sins against you. And what follows in 15, 16, 17 is what's often called church discipline, or I prefer church restoration. This is God's process of going and getting a straying sheep and bringing it back through the process of reconciliation. And if you've ever had to walk through that process, you know this is extremely difficult. Especially for church leaders, this is a hard thing to do when you have a brother or a sister straying away from Jesus. And God calls us to go get them and ask them to come back. And so what happens is, is it goes from 1 to 2. Look at verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the whole church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, which means probably view them as an unbeliever. Truly, I say, whatever you bind on earth, you shall, shall be bound in heaven. In other words, if you follow this process, what you decide on earth is what God agrees with you. If you do it God's way. So if you eventually deem someone an unbeliever because they will not turn back, God's saying, that's my ruling of them too. But that is not a fun process. I've had to go through that probably 10 times in my life as an elder. And the promise of verse 20 is the special comfort then for those involved in a Matthew 18 church restoration process. Just know you can go courageously that he is there among them. Capiche? Mm -hmm. Amen? Just live this, this week. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Turn in your Bibles to the back of your Bible. We'll go to another one. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And uh, could someone read that when you get there, please? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Okay, good. So, news alert. Uh, this is often used about Jesus is standing, knocking at the door of your heart. Right? He stands and knocks at the door of your heart and you need to let him in. I'm um, using this verse for a reason. What do you think is maybe a better way to understand this in the bigger context? And I'll start by kind of get us a, a, a leading start. Who is writing? John. Who is he writing to? The seven churches. The seven churches. Which church is this church here in the paragraph? Laodicea. Laodicea. Was Laodicea doing great or not doing great? <laughs> Poorly, right? What did he say? Look at verse 16. You are lukewarm. And by the way, um, that's not a good place to be. We take cold baths. We take hot baths. We don't like <laughs> lukewarm baths. Amen? <laughs> but because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I mean, this is not good. Uh, Jesus is rebuking this church. And verse 20, then, comes to not an individual, but to an entire church that he himself was not even a part of anymore. I think this is Jesus trying to get back into his own church as a corporate entity that had drifted from faithfulness to him. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove, I discipline, so be zealous and repent. And all of those uh, exhortations are plural. He's exhorting an entire body of people. So, listen, uh, I understand God can be drawing us. I think that's true. And, but technically, I don't love to use the language. He's tapping at the door of your heart. He would just let him in. Um, I think when Jesus reveals himself, it typically has an impact on us. Amen? Like, when he reveals himself, we actually just fall down and worship. He's not begging you to agree with him about knocking on your heart. So, like a sledgehammer, though. Right, right, right. Okay, from Revelation, let's go all the way back to the beginning of your Bible, Genesis. Wait, so what is he telling them? He's saying, 
I think he's telling them that they need to, okay, so let's jump in, good question. You're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I'm prosperous, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Their sin was self-sufficiency. Their sin was they were not dependent on him. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not, not be seen, and south to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove by discipline, so be zealous and repent. Then verse 20, the one who conquers I will grant him to sit on my throne as I also conquer and sat down with my father. He who has an ear, let him hear. I think that their primary sin was the sin of pride and self-sufficiency. And because of that, they had not left room for Jesus at the center. They were the king of their own empire. Their wealth was their God. Um, which, by the way, we need to do a Revelation 2 and 3 series. Because all of these, verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. They apply to us, too. Yeah. He wants communion. He wants communion, ultimately, right? He, yep. Like yep. It, essentially, it's one foot in the world yep. and one foot in with God. And because of that, the Spirit and Christ have been pushed out. He cannot love the world and God. What's great, though, is he wants back in. He, he does. He given up on us. He does. If we cross-reference with Revelation 2, 4, and 5, he says, eventually I'm going to remove my lampstand altogether, which is a dangerous place to be if you're a church that doesn't have the light of Christ or the Spirit in it. Okay, uh, go all the way back to Genesis um, what was that verse? I jotted it down. Genesis chapter 31. There we go. 31. Okay, uh, Hannah Conan, Hannah Montana, freshly christened as a San Diegan. Did you read verse 49? And you can just start with the quote of Genesis 31. The Lord walked between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. Good. Okay, so anyone ever heard this read and stated somewhere? What was the context, Carol? Well, uh, that God's going to be with us, uh, like a, a benediction for a yeah. church. Yep. It's, it's, a, it's a warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I've actually heard this read at weddings. <laughs> the Lord, what's it say again, Anna? Watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. Right? So uh, we have a military in this church. Like I could foresee maybe trying to use it there. What's the problem with using this in that way in the context? Anyone want to take a shot? If your chapter has a title or if you know this story? There was like family strife between Jacob and Laban. Oh, my like, goodness. They're working through family conflict. Oh, not just family conflict. He duped him for seven years of work to marry the wrong daughter, duped him for another seven years of work, and then got seven more years. So this guy had to work for his father-in-law 21 years to marry his two daughters just to get the one he wanted. I mean, this is like deep resentment and hatred. And what they have done in the context is they've taken stones, look at verse 46, gather stones, they took the stones, and they made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. In verse 48, Laban said, this heap is a witness between me and you today. And I think if you dig into the context, the idea is, if we transgress our covenant, we can heap this amount of stones on each other. Like, that was an Old Testament common practice. This is actually a, a sign of accountability that God will judge either of us if we betray our covenant because we actually hate each other. Point being, not exactly uh, fitting for a wedding. <laughs> and yet often it's just whoop, plucked out, thrown in a wedding context. Hey, the Lord be the witness between me and you. Um, hopefully that's not anything about the future marriage there, but... Thoughts on that? Questions? This is fun, isn't it? We're grabbing a random fun text. Okay, I got, I got more. Let's go. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Let's see, just listen to it. You said what? Just listen to it. I'm going to poke at fun of that. Like a Stephen Furtick sermon. Uh -huh. Okay, so Matthew 24, and uh, could someone read verse 40 and 41? Um, then there will be two in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding grain at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. 
Okay, eyes up for a second. All I'm going to tell you is the context is end times, so sometime future. And I want to ask you real quick, by way of vote, do you want to be taken or do you want to be left? Raise your hand if you want to be taken. Raise your hand if you want to be left. Man, you guys are suckers. This is going to be great. Okay, look at the context. And I've been there. Trust me, I've been there. I've been there. Verse 36. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. They were unaware until the flood came and what? Swept them, Swept them all away. It took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. I want to ask you, was the flood a mercy or a judgment? judgment. It was a judgment. It was a judgment that swept away all of humanity except for eight. And then he says, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, in the context, in judgment, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Now, just to clarify a little bit on this, I still think that Scripture as a whole probably presents a view of a pre-tribulational rapture, which is to say that the Lord Jesus will come and we will be caught up together in the air with him and be with him. But I think that this passage is speaking toward the end of the tribulation time when Jesus actually comes to earth, he speaks one word, he judges all of humanity, and many will be taken away in judgment. Those who have come to know him in the tribulation will enter into the kingdom in a natural body. And so in this context, you actually want to be left. You don't want to be taken. Mm -hmm. Because it's clear that it's about the coming of Jesus at judgment. And that would hold true for a post-tribulation view as well. All right, so let's try it one more time. You want to be taken, you want to be left? We want to be left. <laughs> we want to be left. Is that the way you phrased it? I know, I know. I set you up, man. I set you up. <laughs> Um, okay, let me just uh, jot down a few others here. Any questions that I've inspired or frustrations? Ah, oh, here we go. Yeah. What time is it? Oh, 9.06. Oh, 9.06. We're fine. Um, what was it again? John. Okay, John 16. Here we go. This is good. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 16. Um... Ah, here we go. Oh, Aaron, are you in John 16? Could you read verse 13, please? Yes. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever that he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Okay. Ooh. So this verse often, again, lifted out of its context, plastered on the wall, name it, claim it, grab it, twist it, bop it, turn it, mm -hmm. uh, to your own liking. What do you think this verse is often used to support? Just look at it again. Look at those words. Maybe you've actually done this, or maybe you've heard it, or been around it. Jared? I don't know the word for it, or the phrase for it, but just like the Spirit coming to you, speaking something, and then you read that's right. Yeah. Speaking, whatever. Yep. And Essentially, the expectation of a special word from the Lord, right? right? When he comes, he will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak to you and declare to you, not only to declare to you things, but it says the things that are to come. And so many in more charismatic circles will say, hey, here's my proof text for the Spirit is telling you what's going to happen in your life. And I'm declaring over you, Paul, you need to resign from your job and do this, that, and the other. And this will be the text. What is the problem with that sort of practice within the church? It actually has nothing to do with what's happening here in John 16. So, quick little context survey. Um, who's speaking? It's red letters, so I'll give you that hint. <laughs> Jesus is speaking. Who is he speaking to? And you actually have to understand that this is right in the middle of a massive sermon that begins where? In John 14. John 14. And so, 
If you look back at John 13, verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? We know Peter's there. And what we come to know is that this is actually his final discourse, his final speech or sermon with his disciples. This is an exchange between Jesus and the disciples. By the way, do we do and say and get to experience everything that the 12 disciples got to do and say and experience? Quick answer, no. They were unique. They were foundational. And so what he says here in verse 12 is he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, and when did the spirit of truth come? Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. He will guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. I would submit to you that this is not a promise of direct revelation to us and future prophecy, but this is a promise of inspiration for them that would be written down and called the New Testament. This is a promise to the disciples that later on, I'll bring to mind everything that you need to know, and even futuristic things, and you're going to write them down in God's word for us. Does that make sense? It's not a promise of direct revelation. It's a promise of divine inspiration to the disciples. And this is where we have God's living and active word. Amen. Agree, Tim? Yes. Just wanted affirmation from our Bible teacher for today. Okay, let me just pause. Any thoughts, questions on uh, any of these so far? Sir, can you explain that? What's the difference between direct revelation and divine inspiration? Direct revelation would be God speaking to you. His voice in your ear, and it's very common, um, which sometimes I, I think the Spirit can prompt, the Spirit can lead, but I'm very hesitant when people say, God said to me. Right. Because I believe this canon is closed, and when God spoke, it was inscripturated. Amen. So I don't think this is a promise of direct Revelation. I think it's a promise of divine inspiration to write the words of Scripture. First or Second Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Yes. So I, I sometimes debate people on this one. I like to say that people can be because you can go to was it Ephesians where it talks about gifts of prophecy. Mm -hmm. right? So after this canon, after we have the Bible, that you're not getting new word from God. That Holy Spirit can guide you to go here mm -hmm. to the Bible. This is always the basis. So if someone says, yeah, I just, you know, the pastor's like, I just went to the bathroom and I heard from God. You know, right. always test to see right. if it's consistent with what's in the Word. The, the thing that is just grievous to me is it's such an authority play right. for a pastor to say, well, God told me that as a church we need to do this. I like, how do you, if you, if you respect that person, if you think they're your pastor, how do you argue with that? This is your right. spiritual leader. I mean, so again, I think it's it's a source of manipulation a lot of times. Yep. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, I was actually going to feedback on what I was about to say that as well. Just yes. how it puts so much more power like in yes. the person of, or in whoever is saying that. Yep. And if they don't have good elders and deacons around them to say, yep. well, hold on, let's actually go back to the text and look and see, yep. like, does the text say that? Because yep. then that's just a slippery slope yep. of, well, yeah, God told me this too. And he said we're going to take a left and then a right and not two lefts. Right. So. First Corinthians 4, 6 tells spiritual leaders not to exceed what is written. Yep. That's the extent of the authority of a pastor or an elder is what is written. And so on matters of opinion, I have no authority. Mm -hmm. People ask me, should I do this or that? I'm like, I don't know, dude. I can help you think through it, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. If they say, should I get drunk or not get drunk, I can very clearly say, you should not get drunk. For that's dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. The divine inspiration, is it kind of for the disciples, like in the book of Acts, and like John and Revelation, when he's speaking, or uh, writing Revelations, or is it kind of all of it, but then also Paul writes majority of the last books, and he's not in this circle? Yeah, that's good. I, it's a good question. I think that it's a promise to, um, probably to that inner it's not intertestamental, but the period between Pentecost and the full maturity and establishment of the church, you had about a 30-year gap where you still didn't have Bibles. So if Jesus died and was crucified in 32 AD, some of the first books were written in 45 AD. That's 40, you know, that's 15 years. Most of the letters weren't written until 60. So I do think in the first century, apostles and prophets from Ephesians 2 were unique offices that needed to receive direct revelation 
as they went on church planting missionary journeys mm -hmm. in order to convey that. An apostle would come along, he would preach the gospel and display truth for a few weeks at a time. He would move to the next city, a prophet would come up underneath him and convey and reiterate what he said. They both needed help though. Mm -hmm. They needed clarity of mind and actually revelation to get the truth out in a proper way. Mm -hmm. And eventually those, you know, I would argue those same principles found their way into our 27 New Testament books. Okay. Or 26 New Testament books. Uh -oh. 27? 27? Uh -oh. Okay, yes, 27. <laughs> I was debating Hebrews, should it make it or not, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews made the cup way late, so. <laughs> okay, James, uh, sixth to last book of your Bible, or seventh to last, right after Hebrews tucked in there. James chapter 2. Maybe we'll just do like one or two more. Yeah. Um, you say what? You gotta do this like you know, MacArthur will do this. Do like a two hours of QA. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, if there's questions, it's fine. I'm just getting in the word. Okay, James, everyone there? And uh, volunteer, please read James 2, verse 24. And that's when we all said, Amen. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. All right, great. So uh, I don't know what we're doing pro protesting here as Protestants. Let's just go back 500 years and re-enter the Dark Ages. What did it say, Jaime? It says you're justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, the Reformers said we're justified by faith alone, so clearly they were wrong. I hope you sense sarcasm and facetiousness here. Um... You can see, though, where this could trip someone up, right? What's going on in the context? Anyone want to help us? What's actually being said here? Jared? Well, it's just, I mean, you can just go like back a couple verses and see that he's referring back to Abraham and uh, offering up his son Isaac and contrasting the faith and the working. Yeah, good. Great. Any other comments? Agreed. One thing I would add is it's always important to recognize words have a semantic range of meaning. So my favorite example that I shared before is the man was on the bank, the helicopter lowered itself, he jumped in the helicopter, and off they went into the horizon. What scene did I just describe? What do you think? What did you say? So he was on top of, like, and, and what just happened? They, did they rob the bank, or...? Oh, I was actually just talking about a fisherman who was on the side of a river and he hauled in a massive fish and he got it up on the bank and he had to call in the chopper. Call in the chopper. And they had to put the fish in. You see the point? The word is defined by its context. Well, listen, the word justified can mean different things. There is a legal declaration of righteousness and yet justified as a broad semantic ranging word can also mean vindicated or proven. So in the context, look at James 2. What, what is he referring to in the life of Abraham by way of example? There's two different things he talks about with Abraham and the order that he talks about them in matters. Sorry, I've got to get there real quick. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, Abraham, Abraham. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, verse 21, you, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Here's the problem. When, does anyone know what chapter in Genesis did Abraham offer up Isaac? 22? Yes, 22. What chapter in Genesis was Abraham justified? And it actually uses the word justified. 15. 15. In Genesis 15, 6, it says Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him as righteousness. Righteousness and justified are the same term. So Abraham, according to Paul in Romans 4, 4, hold your finger here, flip back to Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Look at this apparent contradiction. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans chapter 4. And verse 4, I'm oh, sorry, verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was what? Counted to him 
as righteousness. That's the same word as justified. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as what is due. And that's not a good thing. You're putting, you're going to say you're going to put God in debt to you? No. But verse 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So if you're not careful, you've got a contradiction between Romans 4 and James chapter 2. And yet what I think James is saying, if you return to James 2, clearly Abraham was saved in Genesis 15, but his salvation was proven legit seven chapters later, and at least 12 years later, when Abraham was willing to offer his son. That's why he continues, and he says, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. I'm in James 2.23. And the scripture was what? Fulfilled that says, and here's our verse in Genesis 15, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is not vindicated, is, I'm sorry, you see that a person is vindicated by works and not by faith alone. And so in the broader context, he's proving that there are types of faith. There's phony faith and there's real faith. And real faith proves itself by works. Not a contradiction to the whole rest of the Bible that teaches faith alone is what saves. But faith should inspire and activate works. 